Today's talk is a very special privilege because of not only the speaker, but the topic. Um, I guess I was inspired originally by Bill Hamilton and long conversations with him and George Williams about the origins of cooperation and how that was relevant to medicine. Never did I dream that it would come to the kind of work that you're going to hear about today. I first uh, heard about Kevin Foster when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study. He had been there two years before, and everybody kept talking about him, but I never took the trouble to look up his work. Stupid me. Um, subsequently, I saw him give what was the best talk at ESEB uh, last year, which inspired me, and I tried to get as many people as possible to watch the video. And I'm so glad he's with us here today to talk about how this basic theory from evolutionary biology turns out to inform not only really interesting things, but things that are likely eventually to have profound clinical implications. Kevin did his first work, his master's degree at Cambridge, and then he went through a succession of wonderful laboratories and places, spending time at Rice with Jonas Strassmann and David Queller. Uh, then he was at the Wissenschaft College in Berlin. Uh, then he was in Helsinki working with Hannah Koko, more then ten, a few years at Harvard, and he's been a full professor at Oxford for the last six years. We're so glad you're here and eager to talk with you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so for those of you that were, uh, you followed Randy's advice and watched uh, the talk I gave at ESEB, you will find it's somewhat similar to the talk <laughs> I'm giving today. Um, there's a few different things, but uh, if you want to leave, now is your chance. Um, okay, so it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you for that very, very nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I started actually my career studying social insects. Um, and so it's been great catching up with some uh, old faces from the social insect world today. Um, but then, for most of my career, I've turned to study the question of how you could take... Oh, I thought I was amplified. Am I not? So I think the microphone is only for the video. Oh, okay. So I can shout then without it. Okay, cool. I like shouting. Um, sorry, my impression was this was amplified, but I guess it's just going to the... But you could watch the movie later uh, if you can't hear me. Um, okay, okay. Uh, anyway, so microbes and stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so um, with apologies for people that have seen these kind of quotes too many times, uh, Stephen. Um, uh, my career is really focused on one of the classic questions in evolutionary biology, which is, you know, why does one organism help another, or indeed not help? Um, both are interesting. And this obviously goes back to um, Darwin and um, he himself recognized, although he had solutions to the problem, he recognized that there was something interesting about cooperation. And in particular, you wouldn't expect one organism to evolve a trait that helps another, you know, for the exclusive good of that organism. And it could be another species or another individual. Um, but as I say, Darwin actually had sensible answers to this, but they were really solidified um, through the study of various diverse animals, um, particularly the social insects. Um, so, this is the hornet um, Vespa crabro, and that's the first species I studied as a um, graduate student. And, um, and what people have noticed, both empirically and theoretically, is one of the key uh, principles explaining why and when you get cooperation is just family life. And there's a strong intuition to this. You know, if you help a sibling, um, genetically speaking, it's very similar to helping an offspring. And so there's cases in evolutionary biology where it makes sense to redirect your resources towards, maybe laterally, towards siblings uh, versus offspring. And that's what we see in things like the social insects. So um, this, of course, was solidified in this very famous and hilariously cited, often cited paper. <laughs> I don't know how you do a hilarious citation. We can work on that together. Um, uh, which you know, was Hamilton, who really sort of argued, yes, we need to think about these genetic associations. OK. So this work is um, seminal and well pinned down, despite a certain, a certain degree of storms and teacups going on in the literature at the moment. Um, and I uh, became interested in how these ideas might be applied to another group of organisms that also live um, in groups and also have varying degrees of genetic relationship with the individuals around them. And these, of course, are the microbes. And so microbes for many years particularly during sort of the genetics era, were focused on as individuals that live in sort of uh, ideally a shaking broth in the lab. Um, and in doing so, we learned vast amounts about their genetics, genetics on which all of my work rests. However, the way they really live is more like this. They live in dense 
and diverse communities where we know that they're secreting all kinds of factors that can both promote the growth of cells around them, like enzymes that break down complex molecules, but also many things that harm others. So many of our antibiotics come from the way that bacteria um, fight um, inside their communities. And so the question then I've been trying to address is, can we apply the same ideas that were so powerful in the study of um, animal behavior to these, these communities? <clears throat> so this is just to remind you what uh, microbes are. And I'm going to talk mainly about bacteria. In fact, I don't, in fact, it's going to be exclusively bacteria today. But obviously, in the grand scheme of things, to a first approximation, microbes are everything. Of course, there's some very interesting exceptions, you know, uh, your good selves notwithstanding. But there's a vast diversity of microbes out there. Um, and indeed, when they live in their communities, you can see many representations from this diverse system. So there's an inherent complexity in studying microbes, but also at the same time, um, there is some hope of solace in their relative physiological simplicity. So this was the question then that has kind of sort of started me going. It's like, well, you know, what do microbes do in these communities? Do they tend to help one another? Do they tend to fight? And if it's uh, one or the other, can we understand principles uh, for why they would do one or the other? And I like to start my talk with a little cartoon that sort of illustrates the basic argument, you know, directly coming from the logic of Hamilton and the animal behavior work, for why it might be important to think about um, how different genotypes interact within a community. So this is my little cartoon. We're going to have a secretor cell, which is red. And this guy is going to release an enzyme that helps everyone around it to grow. So it's going to break down some complex molecule, and all the monomers get fed to all the cells around it. And we're going to, but it pays a bit of a cost to make this enzyme. And then we're going to put that guy in with another genotype that doesn't do this and grows a little bit faster by saving the energy from not making the enzyme. So if we look at this in a well-mixed case, what happens? Well, the red guy <laughs> makes that enzyme. Oh, I've just bought, I've just, this is my brand new Mac, and I'm gonna, we're going to discover a few interesting formatting things. So this is supposed to be this way. Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, so the red guys release their enzyme. It helps everyone around them to grow, but only they're paying the cost. So what do we predict over time? I'm not sure what to predict, depending on what the Mac has done to my animation. Uh, <laughs> but let's see. Uh, oh, <laughs> that one stayed in the same place. Uh, so in this case, uh, what we see is that the red guys basically have paid the cost, but the other ones have got the benefit as well. And so they're being outcompeted. So this is the classic problem of cooperation. If individuals pay the cost and the group benefits, why would the individual bother? Well, one way to make the individuals want to bother is a simple manipulation. We're just going to take our red cells and put them in a little cluster. Now what happens, uh, with some trepidation, um, the red guys now uh, preferentially help their own genotype. And we might expect, under these circumstances, they actually do better. Okay? So this is literally like non-family interactions and family interactions, but at the level of a clone, uh, uh, two, two different genotypes. So all else being equal then, we might expect these conditions to favor competitive genotypes. Maybe you actually make an antibiotic or, or some kind of molecule that damages cells. And here you make something that helps other cells to grow. OK. So does this argument work in microbes? Well, that's the first part of my talk. Well, the first corollary we should ask, actually, perhaps, is like, what is the genetic structure within microbial groups? And what determines whether you end up next to a different genotype or your own genotype? And we spent. Um, a long time thinking about this and modeling it and studying it. And actually, you actually get genetic structure within a growing cell group kind of for free. And I'll just illustrate this in, two mo in a model and an experiment. So in both in our individual based model and in our experiment with a pathogenic bacteria, we've got two colors of cells, but the only thing different is the colors. So we're just going to grow these two neutral genotypes together and see what happens. So if we do it in an individual based model, you get what I like to call psychedelic broccoli. Um, and uh, the reason I do that is because you can note that each florette actually is a single color. So what process has driven this? Well, it's nothing fancy. The model is, is very simple. Um, what we're doing is uh, we're calculating how these cells use nutrients. We're calculating the diffusion reaction equations in the system. And what happens is the cells on the outside use up all the food, and they starve the cells on the inside. And in doing so, they create strong genetic bottlenecks. So only the cells on the outside of our ball of cells can grow, and that creates a stochastic process. And so you get little bottlenecks, and you end up just with a certain very few lineages contributing to the final group. So just the way cells grow, the way they generate nutrient limitations spontaneously generates these kind of patches. And what is nice is you can do the same experiment with Pseudomonas, in this case, um, in a colony, in a sort of quasi-2D world, and you see the same thing. You see these very, very strong uh, uh, stochastic bottlenecks. And indeed, we've worked with uh, physicists and population geneticists to show that you can 
explain these quantitatively um, using sort of statistical physics and population genetics. So this is really just stochastic sampling. There's nothing particularly magic, it seems, going on. Although I suppose there's magic in itself in looking at a colony like this and seeing suddenly that there's all this patterning which you wouldn't see if you didn't label the lineages. Okay, so in uh, the terms of uh, uh, Hamilton, we get sort of family groups, assuming these were different families originally, for free as cells grow. So does this matter? Well, theoretically, we can show it does, and it can generate uh, cases where you get the evolution of a cooperative trait, one of these enzymes, where you wouldn't normally. And this is our individual-based model again. And now we've got, um, I'm using different coloring to, so just to confuse you, um, from my first cartoon. So the red guy now is the non-secretor, and the blue guy is making some enzyme that costs itself, but helps everyone else around it to grow. And if you grow these two in, in, uh, in silico, admittedly, but if you grow these two in a liquid culture, the red guy will be uh, faster growing and outcompete the blue. But you put them in this environment, and um, you see that actually the blue will proliferate and take over. And what happened is that early on, there's these bottlenecks, and that means that blue guys tend to end up next to blue guys more often than, than not. And once they make a critical mass, then they can bloom and take over. And so you get these positive feedbacks, hence the, uh, the, you get this sort of finger formation, although you don't need that for the phenomenon, um, and the cooperators will, will take over. Okay, so that's the theory, but does this actually happen in practice? Well, um, conveniently, at least um, in, in the laboratory, we do see exactly these kind of patterns. So we've done this, and other labs have done this various ways, but this is the example, one, my, my favorite example, it's actually unpublished work, um, of where we see the importance of this emergent structure, as we call it. Okay, so this is um, also relevant for sort of evolutionary medicine, because what we're talking about here is um, a case, we're going to study Pseudomonas aeruginosa again, so this opportunistic pathogen, and this guy makes all kinds of um, enzymes that break down antibiotics. In this case, we're studying one that's on a plasmid, and it's a secreted a beta lactamase that breaks down uh, as penicillin-like antibiotic, okay? So this is put into the periplasm, into the gaps between the two membranes, and it munches the antibiotic and breaks it down. But it also has a, 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 so, a social effect, because not only through cell lysis, but also through um, uh, some loss of the enzyme from uh, uh, the cell, there's a potential for a guy that makes the enzyme to protect a guy that doesn't have it. So it acts actually, I'm not showing you that data, but it acts as one of our cooperative traits. Okay, so if emergent structure promotes cooperation, then if we grow cells under conditions where um, our resistant guy that makes the enzyme can make our little clumps, the prediction is it should outcompete the susceptible cell. And again, I'm not showing you backup data here, but if you do grow these two in liquid culture, then um, the, the resistant guy gets outcompeted very quickly. There's quite a cost for carrying this plasmid. Okay, but if we grow them under conditions that, that they can uh, associate with themselves, um, maybe it can actually spread. And indeed, that's what you see. So this is a colony where we've mixed together um, the two genotypes. And in this case, the red guy is the susceptible strain, the, the yellow guy is the resistant, and we've got antibiotic present. Okay, it's carbonicillin for those of you who like your antibiotics. Okay, so far so good, so this looks consistent, but of course this isn't really a test, because what we haven't looked at, well we've looked at liquid culture, but that's kind of a different environment. But what we really want to do is look at disordered case. So our prediction then is, well, if we have a disordered system, the red guys um, should outcompete uh, the, the, the yellow. And the reason is now, the, the guys that don't make the enzyme can get next to the ones that do, and outcompete them, as in my initial cartoon, and indeed in the model. Well, conveniently, we can do this uh, in a, a very sophisticated way, and we do what I think, I think what we like to call colony mushing. Uh, and what you do each day is you grow these colonies, and you just get a pipette tip and just mix up the colony. So you just order it. And then you just do the same thing in parallel when you don't do it. So this is what it looks like if you don't mix up the colony each day. And uh, what happens when you do is it looks like this. So again, I, we can, I can quantify this. Um, well, I won't today. We have quantified it. But hopefully you can see that this is much more red on average than this. And now the susceptible guy is actually outcompeting uh, the, the resistant guy. So this is a very simple, uh, simple series of experiments. But hopefully what it illustrates to you is we can get the sort of emergence of a cooperative phenotype through this uh, spatial structuring. But equally, we can remove it again by forcing these things to live together. And actually, in this case, reverse the rise of antibiotic resistance. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you now rub all of your infected cuts and such. Uh, so we're not quite at the, the stage of uh, medical recommendations, but the principles at least are interesting. Okay, so this perspective then hopefully um, sort of 
uh, uh, very much reinforces these basic ideas of Hamilton that you know, which genotype is where and who interacts with whom is fundamental to the evolution of traits. And so uh, with Sarah Mitri, um, a former postdoc, now a professor at, uh, at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, um, we wrote a review paper to try and capture this idea. And indeed, this is a cartoon by a friend of uh, one of our students that sort of captured it even better. Um, and that is that for a single genotype, we expect there to be great propensity for the evolution of these sort of cooperative traits, as we call them, traits where one individual does something at a cost of itself, but benefit to the collective. Um, but the corollary is that these things are evolving in order to compete with other genotypes. And so the question then is, what happens when different genotypes meet? And there our prediction is also fairly clear. We'd expect, perhaps most of the time, them to be in conflict. OK, so for the rest of the talk then, or at least the next part, that's what we're going to explore. So what happens when you start to meet other genotypes? And uh, we're going to get into uh, how they detect genotypes and how bacteria fight. OK, so this is our key prediction then. It makes sense in a world of genetic diversity where these microbes really live. They can't rely on having their clone mates around them all the time. They should evolve strategies to detect when there's a non-relative or non-clone mate around. Well, to some extent. OK. so. I started, this is the first thing I ever did when I studied microbes, was I started to look for this. I tested this idea. And I did it, actually, first of all, with dictystelium. But um, I think the more interesting messages actually come from bacteria. But anyway, so this is the kind of thing I faced as a graduate student, uh, quite literally. So this is um, a hornet worker um, of the European hornet. And when they're like annoyed at you, this is their guard posture. So if you, if you go to the edge of a hornet's nest, which I don't necessarily encourage, um, and just breathe on it, so they're very reactive to CO2, a lot of workers will come out and they'll, they'll do this. And so I didn't take this beautiful photograph, but the person that did basically had annoyed this hornet, or at least the hornet was thinking, hmm, maybe I should, maybe I should be wary of you. Okay, so why am I showing you this photo? Well, because if you work with social insects, one of the things that's very striking in many species is that their ability to detect the guys, you know, foreigners coming in and indeed discriminate between them and re respond extremely aggressively. Now, that may be aggressively to you, but actually they're just as aggressive to other social insects. So if you take a worker from a different uh, wasp colony and put it into the edge, it'll get nailed and killed very quickly. So they have very, very specific mechanisms to detect sort of their family from other families. And there's interesting cases where that breaks down, but, but um, by and large, this is a very strong pattern in the social insects. So then, you know, intuitively, I thought, well, micros must have the same thing. They must have ways to detect self from non-self. And I spent many um, happy and, and non-productive hours looking for this in bacteria and, and slime molds. And in the end, I think we have worked out how they do it, but it's in actually a much simpler way than I ever thought. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, very effective. So this was the question then, is there actually this kind of active discrimination in microbes? So to cut a long story short, what we realized is actually microbes have been doing this in front of us all the time, for, uh, obviously for billions of years, and they're doing it with something that's been intensively studied already, which are called bacterial stress responses. So there's a very long uh, and rich history of studying uh, how to kill bacteria, right? We like, we like to kill them a lot of the time, and indeed, how do they avoid being killed? And that has led to uh, the study of bacterial stress responses. If you're a microbiologist, you know this is a vast field, subject to its own conferences and these kind of things. Um, and what we realized was the basic classes of ecological competition that you might face, so very simply putting into exploitative competition, which is um, basically stealing food. Uh, interference competition is like fighting, uh, uh, like you know, uh, biting each other or whatever one does. Uh, and abiotic harm, which are other things, maybe like getting sunburned or something like that. Um, and uh, if you just take these categories and then read uh, a vast amount of literature on bacterial stress responses, which I did one summer, you can convince yourself, actually, that the stress responses do quite a good job of detecting these different classes of threat that a bacteria faces. So there's these guys that detect uh, limited nutrients. There's these guys that detect all kinds of damage to the cell. And these ones that detect things that most of the time will not be associated with a biotic threat. OK, so this, this was good. We organized something. We put it into categories. But of course, it doesn't really necessarily convince anyone that this actually is a real categorization. So we thought hard about what is an exclusive prediction of our model and our association that we can make. So I should say this is with Dan Cornforth. Um, he, he had a, a, a lot to do with all of this discu these, these discussions. Um, 
what is there that's different about our, what prediction can we make that's unique to our arrangement that wouldn't be to other arrangements with these stress responses? And what we reasoned is the following. If you detect uh, exploitative competition or interference competition, if, you ex if one of these stress responses goes off, um, you're being threatened by another genotype. So you might want to do something about that. By contrast, if you're um, uh, uh, experiencing UV damage, that's not coming from another genotype. That's coming presumably from the sun or some evil experimenter with a UV hood, and there's not much you can do about it. Right? So the inference is the following. If you detect this type, you should fight back, and if you detect this type, you should just invest in defense. You should also invest in defense here. So there's our prediction. Okay, I, I like to sort of colloquially summarize it as if you get kicked, kick back. If you get sunburnt, don't shout at the sun. I think that more or less captures it. Okay, so in what we looked at this, and I just started reading even more papers and looking for an association between uh, detecting stress via these stress responses and then making your own weapons, your own antibiotics. And lo and behold, at least in a, uh, uh, this is not uh, a very carefully controlled review, but summary, but um, uh, nevertheless, if you look across these, uh, at this literature, you find basically nearly all cases where you see a link between an antibiotic and a stress response. It's one of the ones we call biotic, and there's only a couple of cases where it's abiotic. And those, those cases also are kind of a bit questionable in their molecular biology. They're sort of, it's not clear. So what this really suggests then to us is that bacteria indeed do detect attacks and they fight back when they do. And that they're using these stress responses in a very clever way, very simple way to detect friend from foe. Um, and this is the only cover I've ever had, um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm showing it to you for that reason. Um, and also because to, I also like to admit uh, that when I told the, talked to the editor about how excited I was about getting this cover, she was like, ah, we didn't have much on that month. <laughs> <laughs> so nevertheless, I remain proud of my cover. <clears throat> okay, so, um, but, but that's, this was this sort of general overview, but do we see the, what we call, ended up calling competition sensing? And indeed you do. Um, in fact, people have been seeing it for years, but there's been some recent work that has really pinned this down. And this is work from other labs. And this is beautiful images from Matt Traxler. And these are two Streptomyces species. And so Streptomyces are uh, filamentous bacteria that live in the soil, and they're responsible for many of our antibiotics, right? So they make many of the antibiotics you take. And there's been intense work on understanding how they make them for obvious reasons. And what you're seeing here is these two species, and this red pigment is, is one of their sort of key antibiotics. It's a red pin pigmented antibiotic. And uh, this, is, this is one of those wonderful images that captures so much in, in just one, one moment. Um, but what you can see, of course, is where this guy is growing next to this one, the antibiotic is upregulated. But when it's on its own, at least to its perception, it's, it's, it's not being upregulated. So they really do detect the presence of other strains and will upregulate things. And in this case, it appears to be due to iron limitation. So Matt thinks that this is actually detecting iron starvation that drives this process. And since then, we started to work on uh, an even simpler system, but arguably more tractable, to also look at this. And so, and this is um, E. coli. So many of you may or may not know that E. coli actually, well, the lab E. coli we have are kind of cows. They don't really do much. But naturally, E. coli commonly carry these plasmids that are, make them into sort of dramatic um, sort of attack, attack vessels. Um, and these are called the colicins. And so when you have one of these plasmids, um, it will make a, a subpopulation of your cells. We're finding maybe up to 10%, 20% uh, lice uh, and release uh, toxins that then go and kill other cells. Okay, and a lot of these things are DNA damaging toxins, and the regulation of this is actually driven by DNA damage. So if one guy attacks another one, they can detect it actively and will upregulate back. So it's a really sort of beautiful reciprocation. So I'm just going to show you then a couple of images in a movie. This, we've done more work than this, but um, I haven't yet made it into a talk. Um, but what you're seeing here is this guy is, um, this is colicin E8. So this, these, these, two, these two cell types are identical, except this guy is carrying colicin E8 and also a reporter strain that basically makes it express GFP and go green when it's making it. So this is your background expression in the presence of a negative strain. So this guy is just still the cow. So we have the cow and the lion, if you like. Uh, or whatever <laughs> you like. Uh, I might choose my animals more interestingly next time. Um, and uh, what you can see is basically this guy is sort of moderate green and has killed this guy a bit, fair enough. But what's interesting is now as so we've replaced this guy with another strain, you know, a tiger, Steve Lyme versus tiger, that's cool. Um, and um, it's Mad March, uh, Mad March Mammal, Mad, no, yeah, that one. Um, and the following happens. 
So, so now this guy's lit up way more because it's detecting the attack coming in from E2. But equally, actually, it's actually been sort of the vehicle for its own destruction to some extent because it's annoyed this one, and this one's now making more back. Okay, so you actually get this reciprocal amplification of the two guys. They get, and they, in behavioral time, they, get, they, they amplify their responses into, to each other. And hopefully, after a long time with video converters yesterday, I can show you a movie of this happening. Um, so these are, this is E2 this side and E8 this side. And this time we've made them both light up when they make, make uh, the fluorescence. And so the, we start them growing and they're like, oh, everything's fine, I'm just growing. They're like, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait. There seems to be something attacking me. And so they start to light up. And what we've also found is, in here, they're signaling to each other as well. They're basically what we think we're calling alarm calling. So they actually respond to the own production of their own uh, 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 toxins, and that amplifies the signal back. This movie was supposed to go for two thirds longer than this, um, but as I was explaining yesterday, I found a video converter that was free and would co convert your videos and then give you only the first third back. Um, <laughs> But it gets greener, so, you know, <laughs> why would I pay for the extra video? Um, <laughs> uh, I just converted to a Mac, so, and I, everything's gone a bit haywire, so, uh, yes? So you shape the how that's moving. Does that tell you something about the signal? The intensity here and here? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I mean, without, this is just informal, but, but this is a dead zone, right? So these cells are being killed. And so this area, oh yeah, so I should explain, there is some physics here. So when you drop bacteria down onto a uh, surface, you get what's called the coffee ring effect. So if you pick up a coffee cup, even a flat one, you get this ring, right? And that's uh, due to uh, uh, the physics of, of water basically aggregating and forming this ring. So when we put down colonies, um, they start off with a high density of cells around the edge, okay? And so that little bit there is, is the high density from the coffee ring. Um, and these guys are able to respond and not, not be killed quite so much. And this is death. That explains it. Yeah. Yeah. The V here. Yeah. So the V is. So so you have to imagine that this is now like a raised uh, region, and this is the. Yeah. This and this is the this is the area closest to the damage, and so you're seeing the highest activation of of the counterattack. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So much in a third of your own videos. Who knew? <coughs> okay. So this all suggests to us that, yeah, we think that bacteria are actually very good at detecting their environments. Um, and in this case, it makes sense, right? What they're doing is they're upregulating attacks when they're attacked. But how else might they respond to other strains? And I asked this question not in the way that we actually did these experiments, but in the way that it might make sense in the talk. Um, because I'm now going to switch to a project that actually does turn out to fit very well with all this thinking. But when I started it, I had no idea. Um, and so. And this is now studying biofilms. So many of you may have heard of bacterial biofilms. I mean, what they are is somewhat of an open to discussion. And people like to fight about what they are. But for our purposes, they're basically groups of dense groups of bacteria that basically attach to surfaces, or not always are attached to a surface. They can be sitting in mucus or something. And then they grow in a dense community. And then you get this, and they often envelope themselves in all kinds of slimy stuff. And, and they create a little world for themselves where they can secrete things and so on. OK, and this is a predominant uh, form of microbial life. People argue that the vast majority of bacteria are in this state, depending on your definition of biofilm. Anyway, so when I started work on bacteria some 10 or so years ago, I thought, I'm going to study biofilms, because this is kind of the social state. And moreover, I'm going to study Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the pathogen you heard about earlier, because this is the canonical model for biofilm formation. So my prediction was the following. Well, this biofilm is this cooperative state. I'm going to mix together different strains which have different genotypes, like taking our wasp workers from different colonies and put them together. And I'm going to see them fight, and I'm going to see the biofilm collapse. That was the argument, OK? And maybe this is an interesting way to study how, uh, back, how you might interfere with bacteria. So I did a very simple experiment where I took one strain, two strain, five, and 10. And these guys are all natural isolates, you know, so genetically different, uh, not, so, so not sort of something from the lab that evolved or something. Um, and then we just calculated the biofilm index. And this is basically this very simple assay where you put them into a little microtiter plate. Um, they attach to uh, uh, the edge of the, the plastic and to the surface. And then you, uh, you allow them to do that. Then you take out, the, at the end, you take out the plankton. You wash it. And so in the cells that remain, you stain with something called crystal violet or your favorite dye. And then you just uh, di dissolve that dye. And then on, very, on a high throughput, which was a key word uh, 10 years ago, um, 
maybe still is, um, you could then assess their biofilm formation. Okay, so all we did was just ask how much biofilm do they make relative to the cells in the plankton, right? Um, and remember, my prediction was that as as they get as you get more strains, they fight more, and the biofilm is going to get worse and worse. We didn't exactly get it right. <laughs> um, what we find is that actually they make more biofilm, okay, consistently. And so this is a kind of messy experiment where you throw loads of things in. So look, we did it more carefully, um, and you see the same thing. So th I just explain these. These are like now dose-dependent things where you take two strains, one and four in this case, four and 69 in this case. The blue is the biofilm, and the red are the cells that are free swimming in the plankton. And, these, uh, and you can basically see that when you add them together, you get more, of what, you know, more biofilm and it gets down again, and the same here, the peaks at a, a, a particular point. But qualitatively, you always see more biofilm. Okay, so the first interpretation is, well, these guys are you know, cooperating and, and they're doing something together to help themselves make biofilm. And that might be true in some cases. But what uh, we also noticed was uh, the following that if you actually fluorescently label these genotypes and actually look at the biofilm, they're dominated by one of the two strains. And basically one of them is getting nailed and killed. So what we're seeing here is a, a sort of when you mix them together, you're seeing an intense competition where one is eliminated and more biofilm. So it's really a response in one strain. So suddenly we had to you know, change all of the way we were thinking about this. And suddenly maybe it makes sense and perhaps with the hindsight of my previous section of my talk. <laughs> if I had that bit then, I would have not spent 10 years on this. Um, okay, so this is just illustrating this point. You take five strains, you label them with YFP and CFP, so cyan fluorescent protein and yellow fluorescent protein, and you mix them together in biofilms. And when they're the same genotype, you're reassured you see half of each. But the moment uh, you put different genotypes in, you know, with some slightly blurry exceptions, you really go to one or the other. And so if you actually look at the median of these, basically one guy is highly dominant. So that was using sort of these very simple crystal violet assays and various messy things. So we wanted to really see does this happen in a very controlled traditional biofilm assay. And so this is uh, a flow cell. And this is my, now the world of microfluidics, which I think is still a key word, I'm very pleased to say. Um, and what we do is we take our two genotypes, we put them into a, a, a flow cell, they stick to glass, then we flow nutrients through, and we can watch them for much longer. And also we can remove the planktonic cells, which do, can do all kinds of complicated things that you don't understand when you're studying those crystal violet assays I talked about. And anyway, just to um, reassure us, um, you see the same effect under these conditions. And so I'm just gonna show you a movie. So we've got 7Y with itself, and 7Y with strain four, and we're just imaging uh, the yellow, because the, the cyan doesn't come out so well with this assay. Um, and basically, you see these guys, and we think what's happening is they're getting more sticky, more attachy, they're less likely to disperse, and they make a much thicker biofilm when there's another guy present. Okay, so somehow we have a detection of another strain, and then the question was how do they detect them? What wonderful kin recognition system have they, have they evolved, was my initial uh, uh, thought. Um, but actually, it just turns out to be something uh, that fits well, much better with our recent ideas, turns out to be a nasty, killy thing. Um, and in this case, it's not a simple antibiotic. It's something, these, these things are actually uh, modified phage tails, and they're called R. pyrocins. They've been known about for years. This is electron micrograph, amazingly, it's from 1969. Um, and these things are basically, if you know your sort of classic model of a moon landing phage with its like capsule, and then it has a, 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 a stem, and that sort of landing gear. This is just remove the capsule and it's just the landing gear and the, the legs. Um, and what do these things do? Well, they land on, the, on other cells and they just punch holes in them. They're a hole punch. They're like, there's nothing more clever than that. There's no toxins or anything that's thought. Um, they're literally just a brutal hole punch. And these things go around and sort of shatter, shatter cells, sometimes completely, sometimes incompletely, but they can be devastating um, and a very powerful form of toxin. So, how do we show that these guys were responsible? Well, we did some uh, 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 purification and sort of classic biochemistry, but this is the experiment that sort of illustrates really that these are responsible for this phenotype. And so I'm just gonna run you through this because I think it's hopefully nice to see how we do these things. Um, so this is a dual flow system now, which I think is rather fun and, and, and clever and you can do all kinds of things with it, but it allows us to put in like a nutrient, in this case, tryptone bros, and then anything else we want down here. And then we can grow things in a gradient and see how they respond to different levels in, in that system. And what we're gonna do here is grow them either, well, this is just this control where we just have nutrients on both sides, but we're gonna add in the, the supernatant from where we grew up the cells, stripped out the cells, and then just take the media 
um, and, and we're going to add that back to another strain. Right? So we've got two strains. One of them, we'll grow them both up. We'll take the cells out of this one and add the media from this one to this one and say what happens. And, um, and what you see in the system is a very strong induction of biofilm formation. So um, just to qualify that, though, this is the experiment. And what you're seeing is you get masses of biofilm at the interface, but actually this is also toxic, right? So you get inhibition down here. So you get this region of, uh, of, of, of uh, biofilm promotion and inhibition. And then what we can do is we can take our second strain and we can delete the genes responsible for making these r piercings and then run the experiment again. Uh, and lo and behold, you go, back, uh, you go back to your control case, more or less. So we really are seeing then these piercings are responsible for our biofilm phenotype. So is this a very specific, sophisticated mechanism? Have they detected particular um, sort of uh, 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 molecules or moieties on these things and that allow them to detect the presence of, of competitors? Well, no, I, we think they're just detecting damage, as in our competition sensing. And our reason for that is you can do this with any old antibiotic. And indeed, if I'd been more diligent uh, in my reading, or at least my thinking, um, I would have realized that people had known these effects about these effects for years. If you add antibiotics to bacteria, they make more biofilm. That's, that's well known. Um, and so we just wanted to recapitulate that in our system. And so this is the same experiment now with some just classic antibiotics, ciprofloxacin, rifampicin, and tetracycline. And these have very different modes of action. They all attack different parts of the cell. And in each case, you see the same thing. So this is your control again. Basically, in each case, you get these bright regions. And this is the confocal of the biofilm region um, that, that, that look basically identical to adding the r -piercins. So this all suggests to us, then, that bacteria have very, very general mechanisms to detect damage, all kinds of damage, i.e. the stress responses. But these all channel into common responses, single phenotypes, in this case, biofilm formation. And we think this makes a lot of sense, because you don't know how you're going to get attacked or by whom. What matters is you're being attacked, and you're in trouble, and you need to respond in a sensible way. And attacking back is one thing, but making a biofilm is another way to defend yourself. It allows you to form a clonal group, and, and they're very antibiotic resistant. And indeed, this is a bane of treating bacteria with antibiotics, is that you promote biofilm formation, and they're very resistant to antibiotics in the biofilm. Good. OK. So, so what do we added then to our genotypic view? Well, I started off by sort of arguing that bacteria are really are able to cooperate when they're in these clonal groups, but they should also care about who's out here. And indeed, we think they do. So many of the intensively studied you know, molecular responses that bacteria demonstrate to all kinds of nasties, we think, evolved at least in part to detect the competitors that they deal with in their environments. And we think that actually for years, perhaps somewhat inadvertently, microbiologists have been studying essentially kin recognition mechanisms in bacteria, albeit ones that work in a very, very simple but effective way. Just basically, am I going to die now um, is a good currency for caring about who's out there. Um, I think you can quote me on that. OK, so now we come to polar bears. Um, so I've thought more about my animal choice here. Um, so, so far, we've been talking about the bacteria as though they live in their own little worlds, doing their own thing, and all they care about are other bacteria. There's many other things they care about this phage, which we haven't mentioned. But one thing that many bacteria care about is, is their host, because many of them live inside another organism. And this, of course, is the very much discussed, arguably over-discussed topic of the microbiome. Um, but from an evolutionary ecological perspective, it's fascinating, because what it implies is you not only have these normal evolutionary ecological rules going on within a community, they're actually subsumed within an evolving unit that has a great interest in controlling those interactions. So um, I hope I'll be not thought of just as a bandwagon individual for studying the microbiome, um, although there is some virtues in being in that. Um, but it's a truly fascinating ecological and evolutionary uh, system to think about, particularly if it occurs inside of a polar bear. It occurs what? Inside a polar bear. Um, you could have put anyone up here, anyone you like, but polar bear. OK. Um, so this is the question then. How does living inside this evolving host that has an interest in how a community evolves and interacts affect those communities? So this is uh, sort of uh, uh, an image that, I, that sort of motivates my thinking a lot of the time. And this is a section from a, uh, a healthy, I'd like to note formally healthy mouse. Um, uh, 
Uh, and these are the epithelial cells at the edge, and there's mucocytes in there that's secreting uh, this dense mucus layer that forms a barrier between uh, the gut, this is the, uh, in, the, in the colon, um, and, and the host proper. And then beyond that is what's called a loose mucus layer, and then there you have the bacteria, and that can be incredibly high densities, as we know. Um, and we also can be very diverse, and so there can be these diverse communities in here and indeed, many of these things form, perform functions for the host, um, but nevertheless, they are an evolving ecological system. And so the question is then, we've started to ask is, you know, what do these guys think of each other and how do they interact? What's the rules of interaction? So the first thing we might do is return to my original question, which is like, what do we expect from the microbes themselves? And so I haven't talked too much about this, but I've been on a bit of a tirade for the last five or so years, trying to argue that we, most of the time we should expect microbes to be uh, sort of competitive. I talked about um, how they might detect competition, but also if you put two strains of microbes together, normally one inhibits the other in some way, just by stealing its food or something. Um, Nevertheless, if you read uh, the microbiome literature, there's an awful lot of it, admittedly, but if you read some of it, you will commonly see kind of utopian metaphors banded around, suggesting that the microbes are all living in a sort of cooperative group that then cooperates with us. Um, and at this point, I'm not, well, not going to start by challenging um, whether or not they are cooperative. Let's just ask the question, does the host even want them to be cooperative? Because that's kind of the assumption. You want this productive cooperative system. But actually, if you start doing some simple ecological modeling, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. OK, so what do we do? So this is with Kat and Jonas, two former students. Um, we started just using classic Locke Volterra models, these ecological models, to look at how interactions between different species affects uh, a, a particular ecological system. And we were, we, we were repeating, but also extending, a lot of classical work over the last uh, 50 or so years. Well, I guess uh, 100 or so years, if you include the original papers. So what do these models do? Well, they capture an ecosystem very simply in terms of the interaction between species and then the effects of a species on itself, so self-regulation. Okay, so there's your two key things. How, what, how strong are the interactions? What is the sign of them? And how do they weight relative to how much a, a species um, inhibits itself? So what we can do with these models then is we can create a vast array of different communities that differ in uh, cooperativity with the different species so how much they affect each other. So ranging from, in this case, fully competitive to mixed to uh, fully cooperative. And we can also look at plus minus exploitative interactions. Um, for the purpose of the talk, I won't mention those, uh, except to say that they behave the same as, as these guys. Okay. So then we can say, okay, what do these communities look like? And I'm, we did this in analytically in the first case, but I'll just show you a simulation because it kind of captures the point. So what we can do is, um, first of all, take a competitive community, put it in, okay? And so they, they, uh, all the species are present, and then we perturb it, we kick it. We just like basically affect, we, we do some abrupt perturbation, could be equivalent to an antibiotic treatment, but in our case, we're just gonna uh, 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 cause a, a large fluctuation in the frequencies of the different strains. Um, or the abundances, I should say, what happens? Well, they all bounce back and you get a bit of um, sort of uh, 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 recurring dynamics, but nevertheless, they, they stay, stay put. But what you notice if you do the same thing with a cooperative system is something much more uh, dramatic. Um, they, they basically collapse and you end up with a fraction of the community you had before. Why does this happen? For very, very simple intuitive reasons. Um, uh, these things, so the positive feedbacks that allow you to make a lot uh, uh, if you're cooperative, are the same ones that drag you down if one guy goes down, right? So you get dragged down with others if you're in, a, in one of these coupled systems. And so, and this is actually general, I mean, some people, we had a, a hilarious diversity of reactions to this work. Some people say it's incredibly obvious and the other people say it's wrong. And uh, I'm still trying to work out which of those is true. Um, Maybe both. Um, no, so, because uh, if you think about networks, coupling is the key thing that makes instability in any network, right? We know that for a long time. And basically, we were recapitulating that, um, but still people don't believe it. Um, we're currently writing a nice, nice response to a response in science about this. Um, but nevertheless, even uh, in, in the process of review, we got all kinds of different opinions, and they really made us pin this down with different uh, mathematical techniques. So for the uh, uh, mathematical people among you, we initially started doing this purely analytically, where this is criticized for being too simple, if elegant. So we went to something called permanence analysis, which is a permutation method. And then we went to an individual-based model, which is what I showed you just now. And all of them show the same thing, because it's obvious that you should show the same thing. OK. So the prediction then the following is non-cooperative and weak interactions are key. 
I should qualify the fact it's obvious by it depends on how you define cooperation as to whether or not you think cooperation is destabilizing. And I think that's probably what we're going to spend a lot of time doing, discussing in the literature for a while. Um, anyway, so weak interactions, for the same reason, a coupled system is unstable. You move a node in a network, and if they're weak interactions, it just moves on its own. If it's strongly coupled, you move that, you move everything else, and that leads to instabilities, okay? So basic network theory, really. But of course, the great thing is, with this, we can indeed uh, uh, look for a real system and try and test it. Another beauty of studying microbiome communities is they are contained in a host that you can study um, in a semi-natural condition, at least, and then ask, uh, what are the rules of interaction? And this work was done by a former postdoc of mine in his lab, um, actually before we did our paper, so we were very lucky in that regard. Um, and in that, they basically fit lock of Volterra models to time series data, where they perturb the system and looked at um, how the species respond to perturbation, and then asked, can you infer the ecological interactions following that perturbation using machine learning? And what they find is, well, they find exactly what we predicted. So this is the interaction strength relative to self-regulation, which is sort of the anchoring point. So you regulate yourself, uh, it's defined as one. And what you see is the vast majority of the interactions they predict between their different groups um, are, are weaker than that. And then they can also estimate from their uh, a model how many of them are positive versus exploitative or competitive. And you can see there's a minor of the positive, positive types that really create these uh, sort of couplings. So, so what you see then is actually what we, we predicted, um, that non-cooperative and weak interactions dominate. I should say, though, that I still think empirically this is up for grabs because, you know, this is done, uh, this is hard to do, this inference, and it's fairly crude, and it's done on only a few large groups. It's not done at the species level. So there's a lot, I think there's a lot to do. I don't want to overstate this as an empirical test, but certainly it doesn't, doesn't refute our predictions. And I think there's going to be a lot more of this done, but it's, it's computationally a challenging problem. Okay, so... To end then, um, I'd like to sort of end with a, a, a sort of a, a, a glimmer of light in the cynical and uh, competitive world of microbes and ask, well, is there actually proper cooperation? So we saw examples where there were positive couplings consistent with cooperation in Chihuahua's data. But is it the case that um, in some cases they've really properly, one species really properly evolved to help another species? And um, just to qualify what I mean by that, I don't just mean one bacteria making a waste product that the other guy feeds on, you know, some ecological uh, chain. I mean like bona fide cooperative evolution. So this is a sort of a classic case of a, of a cooperative system uh, from nature. And this is a plant pollinator system. This is a photo I took on my holiday in Italy last year. Um, I used to be an entomologist, so this is now my outlet to, to waste time uh, running around lavender bushes with a camera for hours and hours. Um, but in this case, what we see, what we know is that the plants have evolved nectar, um, and this nectar um, quite reasonably evolved exclusively to feed the pollinators, right? So, and, and bring them in and make them cooperate. It's not clear that pollinators have actually done much in return, but, but the plants really have evolved a cooperative trait here. And they did it for that reason. It's, it's distinct from, like say, a waste product or something. Um, so the question is, does this actually happen in our microbiome? And we think it does, um, but we stumbled upon it rather than predicted it. Okay, so what does cooperation look like in your gut? Um, well, <laughs> um, this is perhaps a, a nice, it's rep nicest representation I could offer you, but still it's not quite as beautiful as our plants and pollinators. Um, but let's focus on this region here. So in your gut are the bacteroides or bacteroidales, and these make up, um, can make up actually the majority, actually numerically, of the bacteria in your body. Um, certainly, there are the, uh, can be a dominant group. And um, there's about 10 or 15 species in there. And the thing they do best is break down complex carbohydrates. So think not like starch. So starch has very simple, um, easy to hydrolyze bonds between its glucose molecules. There's all kinds of complicated uh, bonds in there that are enzymatically are challenging to break down. And that's, sort of, that's basically you know, one of the big benefits we think of having bacteria to break down those, those uh, carbohydrates. And then we get fed by fatty acids. And so and the way they do this is with these extracellular enzymes, enzymes that break down uh, the carbohydrates, and then they have these importers. That, well, they actually have kind of a hand that holds the complex carbohydrate. They have scissors that snip them, and then they have like a vacuum cleaner that hoovers them in. So they have all of this in, in, in sequence. And the question is then that, that, that uh, I start to think about with my collaborators on this, who I'll show you in a moment, um, was, you know, is this a source for cooperation in microbes? It looks like it might be, right, because this is extracellular digestion. Okay, so this work is done with uh, both Seth and Laurie, who are at Harvard, and really started 
when I, I started chatting over coffee with Seth some 10 years ago. Um, and what Seth really got into was asking the question, you know, how do these enzymes work? And indeed, to what extent do they share their, their breakdown products with others? And he studied one, uh, one strain of Bacteroides. What he found is there was no sharing at all. So the, the import is so good that when they chop the, chop, chop the molecule up, they pull it in straight away, there's almost no sharing, okay? So it looked like it might actually be just sort of a personal cell level system. But then he noticed something sort of really weird, and this is with this strain, bacter or species, Bacteroides ovatus, that makes up, you know, can make up a few percent of your, of your gut microbiome. So it's a, it's a major player in the diverse system that, that, that we carry. Okay, so this is the wild type, and what he did was basically just grow it on various types of sugar, particularly inulin, which is a glucose, uh, uh, sorry, fructose um, uh, polymer, and, and, and I think it likes to break down, right? And so what you can see actually is if you just grow an inulin, it doesn't grow, and that's because it doesn't upregulate the enzymes unless it detects the monomers needed for growth. So the thing that makes this slide more complicated than would be convenient if, you, if biology wasn't biology is that we have to grow them with monomers to get them to grow, okay? So we add in some monomers, either glucose, fructose, or fructose oligosaccharides, and then they grow, okay? So you get some growth, right? Okay, so now what we're going to do is ask what happens if we delete the genes um, that, that are involved with making uh, these enzymes, okay? The prediction is they can't break down inulin, they can't grow. You see the opposite. So in the cases where they can, where they do grow well, remember they don't do so well unless you add the oligos, um, they actually grow better when they don't have the enzyme that breaks down inulin. And Seth did a lot of work to, to study why this happens. And the reason is, it's because this bacteria can just import inulin directly. It doesn't need to digest it. Okay, so what it's doing is, it's got something it can eat and prefers to eat whole, but it's breaking it up and shattering it and letting it diffuse away. So that actually, you know, messes with its own growth. So this, we spent a long time to look at why they were doing this. Um, but in the end, we started to think, well, maybe they're feeding someone else. Maybe this is an example of costly cooperation. Maybe this is nectar. Um, and we, yeah. Uh, to our surprise, we think it is. It does seem to be a system that looks a lot like plant pollinators. Uh, so to demonstrate that, we did various in vitro experiments, but we also did in vivo ones. And this is now in uh, 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 germ-free mice. What we did is we took our wild type and our mutant that doesn't make the enzymes, and we co-inoculated them in a mouse, uh, and we put them on a polysaccharide-free diet. And then over the first few days, you basically see no change. Well, if anything, you see, as you might expect, the mutant actually gains in frequency because we know that the wild type doesn't actually benefit from making these enzymes. So then we can add our polysaccharide in uh, inulin and ask what happens. So now the enzymes are actually useful, um, uh, but nothing happens initially. But then, uh, and we didn't choose this species randomly, we know the species can make use of inulin breakdown products. We add in another species, uh, B. vulgatus, um, and then ask what happens. And if you do that, suddenly there's a benefit to having the enzymes. So in the presence of this other species, the digestion breakdown products suddenly become a huge benefit. And we can also see this in colonies in the lab. We have six minutes left for yes, sorry, I did. I, I thought I might do that, yeah. I'm done. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so I should wrap up, but basically we think this really is, uh, sorry, an example of, of, of some kind of mutualism. We don't know what this guy is doing back, but, and that's, that's an open question. Okay, let me wrap up. I managed to shorten my talk and still talk for slightly too long. Um, so conclusions. Well, so hopefully I've convinced you that you do get cooperation and we can apply these Hamiltonian ideas um, and we see cooperation predominantly within genotypes and microbes and this comes for free due to their spatial structuring. Um, competition between strains we think is, and between species is gonna be dominant over cooperation for obvious reasons and moreover we see evidence that they've evolved all kinds of interesting and sophisticated mechanisms to detect competitors and respond in kind. And very finally, I started to talk about thinking about how this all gets nested in a host. And you can ask the question, well, maybe in fact inside hosts we don't actually want cooperation after all because um, it can destabilize the system. But then there's also this tension with productivity. So maybe in some cases though, we do want it. And the question is how does the host, if at all, regulate these kind of ecological dynamics within inside them? And I'll say thanks to the people that did this work and thank you very much. Apologies for going a bit long. Thanks so much, Kevin. We will ask people to use the microphone to ask their questions, so people listening elsewhere. First of all, thanks for an awesome talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up about the biofilm 
yeah. um, results. So uh, you mentioned that your results suggest a sort of different interpretation of what biofilms are doing, that they may be more a stress response than they are cooperation. And I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, when, you're, when bacteria are making a biofilm, there are many different types of phenotypes, right? Um, for example, you could make a biofilm that floats more easily or one that sinks. Um, would you see those kinds of sort of phenotypic differences among biofilms as potential candidates for more um, cooperative group level yeah. phenotypes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, implicit in my claim that they're a response to competition is that they are also cooperative, but it's just about the level at which it's happening. So the argument for why you would make more biofilm in the face of competition is so that you can actually make use of the cooperation with your genotype in order to fight others. So they're completely consistent. So I don't wish to replace the cooperative model of biofilm formation entirely, but I do want to nuance it to say you will cooperate more uh, when you're faced with a threat. Um, that's kind of the argument. So it's, yeah, it's just to two levels. Hey, Kevin. Um, so uh, you didn't mention local competition as a, uh, so in these uh, psychedelic broccoli kind of yes. arrangements, yes. aren't the guys in the inside, it, it, can you explain why we don't get the local competition? Yeah, effect? local competition cancels yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, basically because in our models and indeed I think in nature, we assume that these guys throw, go through massive dispersal events periodically. Um, so these groups will grow up and on some time scale, they can make use of the cooperation to make a big group, but at some point that group will, will disperse, uh, at least in part, and recolonize. So we're really thinking about a uh, sort of a uh, haystack type model, uh, if you like, where they'll sort of, you can benefit from your proliferation um, uh, without f suffering from l too much local competition in the long and, term. And, the, and then these big spatially, oh, sorry, and these big spatially, I mean, they must be huge, those things compared to the scale of the, of the bacterium themselves. Yes. Um, uh, it can be infection, of course. That's one. That's one example of this. Right. And yeah. why doesn't the center, um, in the center, they're just competing with themselves? Yes. You think there'd be an advantage to, to, since, it, it's because they're building up numbers for this dispersal event. Is it? It's a good question. I think it would depend very specifically on the ecology. I mean, uh -huh. there's some people view the inside as kind of anchors that are holding the whole system together. So you just sort of you accept your role as a tree temporarily or permanently, you know, as a, as a tree trunk. Um, but um, it would, yeah. It, it, I think I think, but those guys are also the best protected from outside. And so if you hit them with antibiotics, they're the guys that survive. So there can be fitness benefits to being inside. And if you're um, if you're faced with uh, an, if you're infected bacteria and you're faced with immune system again it can be a good place to be and so um, I think the actual sort of uh, 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 community level dynamics and metapopulation dynamics in in nature can be very complicated so there will be some local competition and such but I think if you think about an infection model it becomes fairly clear the dynamics become fairly clear yeah yeah anyone other questions okay then thank you so much right, Kevin. Thank you.